this event, The Life and Legacy of John Glenn. I'm Brian Odom, the acting NASA chief historian. From his birth on July 18, 1921 in Cambridge, Ohio, John Glenn certainly lived a life filled with excitement and incredible accomplishments. One of the original Mercury 7 astronauts, Glenn's orbital flight aboard Friendship 7 on February 20th, 1962, came at an incredibly important inflection point in the early years of the space race with the Soviet Union. His return to space on October 29th, 1998, aboard the Space Shuttle Discovery's STS-95 mission, capped an incredible career in space and cemented, finally, his legacy as part of that program. Today, I am pleased to be joined by an incredible group of folks here, uh, as we'll all find out in a bit here, uh, as we discuss Glenn's life and legacy. First, we have the NASA Administrator, Bill Nelson here, uh, Bill. Then, we have NASA Glenn Center Director, Dr. Marla Perez-Davis, and our invited guest is historian Jeff Schessel. Uh, first, I'd like to welcome Dr. Perez-Davis to start us off before turning our, to our discussion with Jeff, the author of the new book, Mercury Rising, John Glenn, John Kennedy, and the New Battleground of the Cold War. But first, let me introduce Dr. Uh, Perez-Davis. Uh, Dr. Marla Perez-Davis is director, currently the director, of NASA's Glenn Research Center in Cleveland, Ohio. Prior to becoming center director there, Dr. Perez-Davis held several leadership positions at Glenn, including deputy center director, aeronautics research office director, project liaison and integration office chief, and the electrochemistry branch chief. And now to turn it over to Dr. Perez-Davis for some opening remarks. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for today's program. I'd like to thank Dr. Aron for organizing this event, which is part of a week-long celebration that culminates this Sunday, 100 years from the birth of a true aviator, space pioneer, and a devoted public servant, Senator and astronaut John Glenn. As the first American to orbit the Earth, Glenn became an instant national hero. As his flight helped NASA learn more about human space flight and set us on a course to win the space race. I'm looking forward to hearing today's speaker share his insight on the historic Mercury Friendship 7 mission in 1962. 30 years later, Senator Glenn flew once again on space shuttle mission STS-95, participating in investigations about the aging process. On March 1st, 1999, the name, the NASA Lewis Research Center in, Ohio, in Cleveland, Ohio was officially renamed the NASA John H. Glenn Research Center at Lewis Field to honor this remarkable man. Later that spring, our center hosted a full day of festivities, including a parade and ceremony. As Senator Glenn spoke to the gathering, he expressed his honor being associated with the center, his historical contribution and bright future. Noting the slogan he saw in one of the parade floats, expanding horizons, opening frontiers. He challenged the men and women of NASA Glenn to continue working to make that mission a reality for our future explorers in air and space. I am going to read to you what Senator Glenn said to our staff that day, because I couldn't possibly say it better. Here is the passage from his speech. Expanding horizons, opening frontiers. And that just about said it. It say it for the lab here, it say it for NASA's activities. Expanding horizons, and opening frontiers. Every single bit of advance that ever been made by humankind in all of the history has been made because somebody was curious. Curious about how we do things better, how to do things differently. How if we just knew this little bit of information, would that unlock a secret to something else? In medicine, engineering, transportation, in science across the board, is taking that bit of curiosity to move us forward as humankind. And that's what you are all involved with right here. It is expanding horizon and opening frontiers. That's what he said that day. And we at the center, bearing his name, continue his legacy of exploration, inspiration, and discovery, as we make impactful, lasting contribution to our nation and prepared to send the first woman and the first person of color to the moon under Artemis. Godspeed, John Glenn, and thank you for the example you set for all of us. Thanks. Back to you, 
Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Perez Davis. Really appreciate that. And the inspiration, uh, uh, certainly, that we draw from Glenn's life, you, you encapsulated that. Uh, now I'd like to uh, you know, welcome our, our someone who needs no introduction, obviously, our NASA Administrator, uh, Bill Nelson, uh, to the stage, and introduce our, Je our guest, uh, Jeff Schessel. Uh, first, Jeff. Uh, Jeff is the author of several works here, notably the one we'll talk about today, Mercury Rising, but also uh, Supreme Power, Franklin Roosevelt versus the Supreme Court, and Mutual Contempt, Lyndon Johnson, Robert Kennedy, and the few that defined a decade, both selected as New York Times Notable Books of the Year. Uh, he is a former speechwriter for President Bill Clinton and is a founding partner of West Wing Writers. A Rhodes Scholar, uh, he holds degrees from in history from Oxford University, Brown University, and is a frequent contributor to the New York Times and the, Was the Washington Post and the New Yorker News Deck. So I'll turn it over to the administrator. I'm going to stay on, but uh, administrator, if you would uh, go ahead and open us up. Well, this is a real treat for me to interview uh, Jeff because uh, I read the book. As a matter of fact, I listened to it on Audible and I couldn't put it down. Uh, and I've recommended it to a number of people. Uh, it captures a part of our American history that not only is important to organizations like NASA, but is important to the, the, the success of our country uh, because of what we had come out of in that uh, uh, face down with our mortal enemy, the Soviet Union, with nuclear uh, warheads uh, facing each other. And out of this came a spark that suddenly we were behind. Suddenly they held the high ground, first with Sputnik and then with Gargarin and Titov. And after Gargarin had already flown, we could only get into suborbit with uh, Shepard and with Grissom. And then came delay and delay. And then in February of 62, John Glenn took off on an atlas that had a 20% chance of failure, and there's no looking back. <laughs> and America won that space race, which ultimately allowed us to have a partnership with the then Soviet Union in Apollo Soyuz and now the partnership continues with the Russian Space Agency. And so I think Jeff has hit a part of American history that is pivotal. And I want to know how, since you've talked about or you've written about Franklin Roosevelt and all these others, how did you zero in on this particular part of our history, Jeff? Uh, well, first, uh, Administrator Nelson, I just want to thank you for those very, very kind words about the book and, and for joining us here today. It's really an honor to, to be here in conversation with you. And I, I want to thank Dr. Odom and, and Dr. Perez Davis for your comments and for joining us as well. Uh, it, it's really a, a thrill for me, a treat. Um, and, and I appreciate what you said about the context of, of the book and the story that I'm trying to tell. I'd like a a lot of American kids, I grew up uh, fascinated by space and fascinated by the individuals who'd flown into space and, and, and the, the heroic accomplishments of, of those Americans. Uh, but as I look back from a recent vantage point, I wanted to understand a little more uh, the significance of John Glenn's flight. I understood that he had become the first American to orbit the Earth and that that alone guaranteed him a place in history. But the reaction to, to Glenn's flight seemed uh, ho almost wholly out of proportion to that, that simple fact. It was significant, but why was it so significant? And I think it really comes back to the, the Cold War context, uh, as, as you, Administrator Nelson, described, that the space race, we have come to think of the space race as something that happened over here on its own timeline, and the Cold War was happening there in Berlin and in Cuba and in Southeast Asia. But at the time, they were understood to be part of the same conflict. That was certainly how President Kennedy understood them. That was certainly how the Mercury astronauts and everyone at NASA understood them, that it was part of this greater global struggle 
between two systems, between freedom and totalitarianism. And when you look at it through that frame, then you begin to understand why the buildup before John Glenn's flight was so significant and why the response afterward was what it was. So how did President Kennedy, who really didn't know much about space and probably, as you suggest, uh, didn't care a lot about it, but he he was he had this incisiveness that he could pierce through and he could see the political ramifications of something. And he saw that this was a moment in time with a technological program that could uh, vault America into the lead. How, how did he come to that uh, conclusion? He came to that conclusion slowly, a little reluctantly, but inevitably, I would say. In the late 1950s, when Lyndon Johnson and others in the Senate were leading the discussion nationally about space, John Kennedy wasn't particularly interested in it, as you said. But when he ran for president in 1960, he understood the symbolic, the symbolic power of space exploration, both domestically for a nation that had begun to feel that maybe it had lost its edge and its initiative in the years since World War II, and also globally in this larger struggle that we were talking about. And the nations of the world were watching to see who was going to take the lead and uh, made certain assumptions, which were not unreasonable, uh, unreasonable about what that said about the nation's scientific capacity, its technological capacity, and its military capacity. So Kennedy in 1960 ran in part on the issue of space, and he said repeatedly that it was unacceptable and dangerous for the United States to be second in space. Now, what he didn't have at the time was a plan to put America in first place. That was gonna take some time and was gonna take, frankly, some prodding from the Russians because it was really only after that Gagarin flight that, that you mentioned that Kennedy awoke to the fact that he needed a solution and he needed it now. Um, I recall when I was a young congressman, I was on the floor of the house one day and Tip O'Neill, the speaker, was there and he beckoned me over and he knew that I was going to fly. This is years later. Uh, and uh, he says, let me tell you, when I was a young congressman, young Boston congressman, and I was down at the White House with President Kennedy, and he said I'd never seen the president so nervous. He was just pacing back and forth like a cat on a hot tin roof. And he said he, he pulled over to his aides and he said, what's wrong with the president? And they explained we were getting ready to fly Alan Shepard in suborbit after we had been surprised by Gargarin's flight. And here we were in this catch up mode and, and he was so nervous to make, uh, to, to want that mission to be a success, which of course it was. But then shortly after Alan Shepard, then Kennedy gets this bold vision, and he goes to a joint session of Congress. Tell us about that. That's right. Well, that's, that's a fascinating window into what Kennedy was experiencing at that time. He understood the stakes uh, politically, geopolitically for the country if, if, they, if we were to fail. If the Alan Shepard mission ended in any way in failure, it would happen before the eyes of the world. The Soviet Union, because it was, of course, a totalitarian state, was enabled to fail in secret, which they did. When rockets blew up, boosters blew up on their launch pad, no one saw it who wasn't physically present. Uh, when one of their cosmonauts died in a really a horrific training accident, uh, this was not known for, for decades. And so there was an aura of, of invincibility to the Soviet program because all we ever saw were the successes. Whereas when our rockets exploded on the launch pad, the news cameras were there and, and it, it would appear in newsreels around the world and in newspapers. So Kennedy understood th these stakes. And it, it was after uh, Shepard's successful flight, as, as you described, that he was ready to make that, that bold commitment to go to the moon. Uh, the logic of it was that it was a long-term goal. And we knew that we, there was no way the United States was going to catch up to the Soviet Union in the near term. 
they just had too big a lead and we had too much catching up to do. But if you set a goal that was far enough away, literally, I guess, in terms of the moon, but also in terms of time, that that was going to require new technology that hadn't even been imagined yet, that was going to require investments on a massive scale over a long period of time, that maybe, there was no guarantee, but maybe we would have a chance to leapfrog the Soviets on the way to the, on the, way to the moon. Although the Congress did increase the funding for the program after that speech that was received, as you point out in the book, in a kind of ho-hum fashion, what then propelled President Kennedy to go to Rice University, make a follow-on speech, and when did that occur that he really poured the juice to the program? That speech occurred in September of 1962, so uh, about a year and a half after the initial speech. And you're absolutely right, as I describe in the book, we, we see the sound bites from these speeches and, and the boldness of uh, Kennedy's commitment uh, rings through the decades since. And we know, of course, that this was a successful gamble that he made, that we did get to the moon by the end of the decade. But as you said, uh, the, the, the members of Congress, the senators in that chamber uh, received it very differently. And Kennedy knew it. It's really interesting if you go back, as I'm sure you have, Administrator, and you watch that full speech, that after he has made this pitch that we should get to the moon by the end of the decade, he goes off script and he sort of shuffles the pages nervously and he looks down and he hedges. And he says, and I'm paraphrasing here, he says, listen, this is a, a huge commitment, uh, both in terms of uh, the federal budget and in every other way. And I ask you, the Congress and the American people, to make sure that you're committed to it. Because if you're not, the worst thing in the world would be to start along that path and then fail to get there. And when he went back to the White House, he talked to his speechwriter, Ted Sorensen, and he said, in effect, I don't think I sold it. I was reading the body language of, uh, of the members in, in my line of sight, and I don't think they were buying it. And in fact, the press wasn't as excited about it as Kennedy might have hoped. The, the newspaper coverage the next day focused not on the great adventure of going to the moon, but on the cost, which was a concern of Kennedy's as well. So it took some time for him to lead the American public and the, the, the members of Congress toward this goal along with him. And so 10 months later, John Glenn launches successfully. Uh, the nation is absolutely riveted to this all-American boy uh, who is now uh, bringing uh, the U.S. out of the doldrums. And is it at that point that uh, Kennedy then pours the juice to it and says, we're going to do this in the decade and, and we're going to be successful? He had announced the, the goal uh, prior to Glenn's flight. He had announced the goal of going to the moon by the end of the decade back in that May 61 flight. And Glenn doesn't fly, as you noted, until February of 62. But he, that really is the moment, as, as you've said, when he begins to pour it on. Because the, 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 the moonshot goal just was not credible prior to Glenn's flight. And it wasn't as if Glenn's flight in itself meant that we were certain to get to the moon or that we were certain to get there before the Soviets. But it really, for the first moment, Americans and our allies around the world were able to believe we had a shot. This was possible. This was what made the moonshot goal credible, even, as I understand it, within NASA. Uh, within NASA, there was a lot of excitement about the goal, and there was a commitment to the goal, certainly, but there was also a lot of doubt and skepticism, uh, because, of course, those who were most intimately involved with the space program knew what a struggle it had been just to get these few men that we've been talking about into the suborbital range and then ultimately this orbital flight of Glenn's. So among the original seven, and of course, they get extraordinary publicity, but Glenn rises to the top uh, as uh, the, the all-American boy, uh, this incredible story of a devotion to a wife, uh, Annie having this speech impediment, uh, uh, just, just down the line, uh, American, red, white, and blue. But there was fierce competition, and John felt rejected because... Alan Shepard and then Grissom, and yet he ends up 
getting the cake with the cherry on top with the first orbital flight. Tell us about that. Well, you're absolutely right in describing the way that, that Glenn was seen and understood. And this is really who he was. I mean, they would often tease him, the other astronauts, and they'd call him the Boy Scout or they'd call him a Sunday school teacher. He was both of those things. He was also, and they knew this as well, he was also the most decorated combat pilot of the entire group. Not all of them had even fought in combat. Alan Shepard had never fought in combat, and it was sort of a sore spot with him. They were all brilliant test pilots, but but Glenn was was the most uh, successful of all of them in, in wartime and had also been the only one as a test pilot who had achieved national fame. He, in 1957, had set a, had set a speed record flying a Crusader jet from Los Angeles to Brooklyn in three hours and 23 minutes. And he wound up on the front page of every newspaper in America. He wound up with a, a, a multi-week stint on Name That Tune on, on CBS as a contestant. He became a celebrity and he became really adored by, by the, the American public. So when they're selected as, as astronauts in 1959 and they're, they're introduced to the public, Glenn is already very well known. And there is a sense on the part of the public, on the part of the press, and even many in NASA, that of course Glenn will win this competition to be the first in space. He stands above all of them, um, really any way you, you look at it. And Glenn expected that he was gonna come out on top. Now, in fairness, so did Alan Shepard, and so did Deke Slayton, and so did most, if not all of the others. They were used to winning, they were used to leading. And so it was a huge shock to, to Glenn's system. Um, when Alan Shepard was selected first, Gus Grissom, as you said, was selected second, and Glenn was made backup to both, which in a way was adding insult to injury. It was very tough for him for a period of time to accept that. In fact, he didn't accept it at first. He wrote a letter of protest to Bob Gilruth, the head of the space task group who made the decision. He didn't get very far with that protest. But as, as you said, Administrator Nelson, he wound up with the bigger prize, which was the first orbital flight. And there was a lot of luck to that, just in terms of the timing. If he'd been selected first, then he wouldn't have gotten the orbital flight. And the orbital flight, by the time it happened, had assumed greater and greater significance for some of the reasons we talked about earlier. And afterwards, he didn't get to fly again. I always heard that it was Kennedy that said, you can't fly again, you're too much of a national hero. But you suggest something different in your book. This is a story that had, and in a way still has a lot of currency because it's hard to explain otherwise. Why wouldn't John Glenn go back into space? Uh, it was an incredibly successful mission and these were never supposed to be one and done. It wasn't, you know, get to the back of the line or, or fall out of the program. So he and the rest of the country really expected that he was going back into space and in fact, there were a lot of predictions, including one made by, by your predecessor, uh, James Webb, that perhaps Glenn would be the, the first uh, to walk on the moon. This was the expectation. And so it seemed that the only way to explain the fact that this didn't transpire was that President Kennedy had seen the importance of Glenn as a national symbol and ruled it out on safety concerns. But there's really no evidence of this at all. And Glenn heard this story and maybe found a little bit of comfort in the story. And he, he told it in later years as something that he had heard, not something that had necessarily happened. But there's really no evidence that Kennedy ever got involved in making these sorts of decisions. Tell us about writing his children a letter before the flight saying he might not make it. This was uh, the most startling uh, thing that I found, document that I found at the Glenn Archives at Ohio State, which is an incredible collection of his materials. And I wasn't looking for it. Uh, there's always a serendipity to these, these sorts of research missions. And there it was in a folder, and it took me a, a little while to figure out what it was. It was a script that he had written for, as you said, a recording that he made that was uh, meant to be played for his children who were teenagers, his two kids, if he didn't come back alive. And he also made a recording for his wife, Annie, as well. And this script makes clear, this was a very, very frank recording. It begins, if you hear this, I've been killed. And he goes on to talk about his belief in God, his belief in an afterlife. He even talks about a signal that he wants to send his kids from heaven so that they know that he's there and that he's okay. 
he talks to them about the the funeral that uh, he will have at Arlington, in which a, a case in which there probably wouldn't be a body to to bury. I mean, very very difficult Frank stuff that he wanted to be sure that that he said what he needed to say um, directly to his kids in this way. And in fact, and I, I found this uh, to be a really moving and 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 in a way a surprising fact that. When Glenn was in that capsule and he was strapped in and he was sitting atop that Atlas rocket and he was getting ready for liftoff and the countdown was was going down, he was patched through to say goodbye to Annie. And one of the last things that he said to Annie was, did you get the recordings that I made? This was very much on his mind. Um, and of course, this larger than life person uh, he doesn't fly. He, uh, years later, convinces your former boss, President Clinton, to uh, let him be a part of the space shuttle program and does that extraordinarily at age 77, of which I've talked to those crew members, and they said John participated in everything at that age and did it exceptionally. Uh, but his life was also a series of disappointments. Uh, he, he talks to the Kennedys. They want him to run for the Senate. He slips in the bathroom, has an inner ear problem, has to back out of the first Senate race, runs the next Senate race and loses. And here he is, this national icon. And yet, he has to go through suffering again, twice, before he's elected. Talk about that and talk about his success as senator. That's absolutely right. I, I mean, it's easy to look back and, and gloss over all this and see this as a, as a charmed life. And of course, in many ways it was. Um, and yet at the same time, there were big disappointments. That was, at least for a while, a huge disappointment that he didn't get to fly first or second. And that took time for him to, to reckon with. There was the fact that he never got that, that chance to fly in, in Gemini, that he was not invited to be part of the, the Apollo program, that it was clear that they were trying to edge him out into a desk job that he didn't want. He wanted to fly. And so finally, he accepted the entreaties of the Kennedys, as, as you suggested, and decided to run for Senate in 64. But that injury took him out of the race. And it was more than ta being taken out of the race, but the recovery was very slow, it was very painful. It would take him 10 minutes to essentially almost crawl along the wall to get from his bed to the couch in the morning. And this is a a vigorous guy who had just been up in, in space and, and had, had aced every physical test that he'd ever taken. He'd never had an injury in wartime. And so these were these were tough things to recover from. And then, as you said, the political losses and then runs for president, as we know, in 1984. And even though initially the Reagan White House saw him as the strongest Democratic challenger, it didn't emerge that way. And he didn't wind up winning a, a single primary. So the, there's um there was no, Glenn understood, he often talked about his faith this way, that, that being a person of faith uh, gave you no guarantees. It was, as he often said, and this was his mother's advice, it was a 50-50 proposition. And 50% uh, of it at least was up to you and your hard work and uh, you were gonna succeed and you were gonna fail and you had to keep at it. And that was very much the, the way he approached not only his, his life as a pilot and an astronaut, but as a politician as well. Uh, did John have an appreciation of what Lyndon Johnson had done for the space program? Because Kennedy gave the inspiration, but a lot of the implementation was Lyndon Johnson. He did. Uh, he was aware, and I think there was a lot of awareness within NASA, certainly, and, and on the part of the astronauts, that Lyndon Johnson had done more than really anybody, and that includes Eisenhower, and that includes Kennedy to really drive the space program forward in its most difficult period, to f give it proper footing, to give it proper funding, and to set America on the path to the moon. Uh, they were well aware of that. And in fact, when the astronauts um, had just been introduced to the public, as I mentioned in 1959, they, they were sent to Capitol Hill for a, for a tour. Uh, Nixon, the vice president, stopped by, did a quick meet and greet and a photo on the Capitol steps. 
and was gone. Eisenhower didn't have have time for them. But then they were ushered into Lyndon Johnson's palatial rooms, which of course uh, you know very well were referred to as as the Taj Mahal. And this was really the meeting that mattered. They were meeting the the the, the American uh, who was again doing more for the, the the space race than than any other. So I know we're almost out of time, but uh, you as a historian, if you would look and compare, we were in this space race with the Soviets. We were able to compete and ultimately uh, win a victory. And here we are over a half century later, and we now have a very aggressive competitor in the Chinese government and its space program. And they are challenging right and left and make no bones about it publicly that that's what they're doing. You want to compare the two space races? Absolutely. And, and I think um, I have followed with interest your statements and your leadership on this issue. You've been very clear. Uh, about the challenge that that we face from from China in space, and of course the relationship, as President Kennedy often stressed, as Lyndon Johnson stressed, the relationship between what happens in space and what happens on Earth, and these things are not separate, and they they are part of, as you have said, Administrator, uh, they're part of of the same larger struggle again between freedom and totalitarianism in our in our own era sometimes it takes a competition like this to get america to to wake up and, and get up and commit to the fight but i think what's clear now what i hope is clear now is what became clear to president kennedy in 1961 that there was no backing out there was no opting out that this was a challenge that if we were not going to engage in it and on, on our terms then our adversaries were going to set the terms. And they did not always have the peaceful purposes that, that we did. Uh, they did not always intend in space to act, as the Space Act said, on behalf of all mankind. And so I, I think that there's, again, there's, there's, there's no opting out. This is a challenge that uh, whether we created it or not, uh, we, we must engage in it. It's important, not just symbolically, but in all sorts of practical ways. Well, Jeff, it's been a delight for me to interview you, and uh, I, I am looking forward to reading anything else that you write, uh, because the words came to life off the page to me. Uh, and thank you for the insight uh, that you have at a critical time People often forget, just think uh, in that era when John flew, uh, Kennedy had been embarrassed by Khrushchev in Europe in their first summit. Uh, shortly around, uh, he, he had the, the embarrassment of the, uh, the invasion at the Bay of Pigs in Cuba. Uh, then in October of 62, he went into that terrible confrontation on the Cuban Missile Crisis where we almost had an exchange of nuclear weapons. And all of this melee, uh, John Glenn is taking the hopes of America into the heavens. So thank you for capturing that. And you've done it so well. Well, thank, thank you, you, Administrator. Thank you for your generous comments and for inviting me to, to talk with you today. It's been a real thrill and a real honor. Well, good. Look forward to visiting. <laughs> I well, do too. Guys, this has been incredibly, uh, you know, as, as a historian, just to sit and listen to you guys have this conversation, it's incredibly important because you bring out the incredibly, the, the, the issues that are at play here, right? Why is it that history matters? Why is it that knowing this history is important, right? Uh, and I think you've you've done a great job, Jeff, of laying that out. And, and Administrator Nelson, you've asked the right questions to get to get to that context because the context is so important to the history. We may remember the people and the events and the dates and the times and all of this, but knowing how these things are laying within this context is important. And Jeff, I, as a as a final question, really, and kind of to one of the administrator's points, you know. Um, you, you've spent a lot of time in this history, and 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 as a historian, how did you get to those documents? Uh, and and you you mentioned the serendipity of that, but 
what's next and and if you you know if the history office can provide you with anything or you can get your hands on new documents where might this story go that it hasn't gone already and what context what might we know in the future from your work well I, thank you uh, again dr odom thanks for those comments and and i i have to say that all of us who do this kind of work do it with a certain humility that there is always more out there that there is always more of this story to tell and i was incredibly gratified to find that underneath there's a sort of rich topsoil of material that gets turned over and turned over and it's all very familiar to those of us who have an interest in in these in these stories and yet if you dig a little deeper there, there's more and a lot of it hasn't been seen or hasn't been discovered or hasn't been put in a, in a, in a, a different context, as uh, is the case with some of what we've been discussing. And so um, it's tough to finish a book like this because you know there's there's more out there. And uh, uh, I haven't, uh, my, my curiosity about the, these people and these decisions and these issues is not ended when I sent the final manuscript. So I would love to continue digging and writing and, and thinking about all this and, and love to continue this conversation with you. Yeah, no doubt. We, and we look forward to it. Let us know from the history program what we can do, because, you know, that's our goal as part of NASA is making sure, ensuring that this history is, this analysis is done, but make sure the documentation is there, you know, in the archives, right? We've got to preserve these things to make them available for future uh, future historians to perform this analysis. You know, you think about JSC, you know, you know, and the oral history program that's out there and the work that they do and, you know, NASA headquarters and across the agency, archivists are, are, are working to make sure we have this story. So I welcome any uh, future uh, <laughs> future opportunities to, to talk it through. You uh, come on it. Thank you. You got it. And really, you know, Administrator Nelson, just one, you know, I, I really, I, I really am, uh, I've, all, I've talked to you several times about history and I understand your passion for history because you're part of that history yourself, right? I mean, that's, you know, so, you know, I, I I think we could, we probably could have spent a whole, uh, 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 several parts of this talking about Glenn's experience and then comparing it to your own experience. So, uh, so. No, you, you can't compare that. Uh, uh, John Glenn is by far in a class of his own, but I'll tell you, the history we're going to write in the next few years is going to be an exceptional uh, part of our American history. And I suspect in a time in which we are so politically divided that we are going to see our nation's space program going back to the moon, the first woman, the first person of color getting prepared to go to Mars with humans. I suspect that what you're going to see is that is going to be one of the unifying factors for our country in this time of political division. And the Lord willing, maybe that'll just bring us together. There you go. I think that's a great place to stop. Uh, Jeff, is there anything that we didn't uh, get to that you wanted to that you wanted to talk about? Or well, I have a lot of questions for the administrator. At some point, we'd like I'd love to reverse chairs here and and uh, be uh, be be asking the questions next time. Hey, you got it. Maybe we can arrange that. Uh, administrator Nelson, does that sound like a good opportunity for the future? <laughs> I'm on. <laughs> All right, folks. Well, I think we've reached our time and I really enjoyed just being a participant and listening to this conversation. And I hope everyone else has as well. Uh, and Administrator Nelson, uh, Jeff, thank you for, for participating. Administrator Nelson, thank you. Jeff, uh, you know, appreciate the research. Uh, you know, you, you've done an incredible job here. Um, so, folks, uh, look forward to capturing that history going forward and then in other events in the future. But uh, from now, we're going to sign off and thank you for joining us, both of you. Uh, Dr. Prez Davis, thank you for those kind opening, uh, inspiring open remarks. Uh, and uh, I think we're good. Everybody have a great day.